National History Academy. Hello, my name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy and welcome to our presentation tonight with Melanie Adams, who we're very privileged to have, who's the director of the Anacostia Museum of the Smithsonian. Uh, also with us tonight is, is Dr. Brent Glass. Uh, Dr. Glass will be introducing uh, Dr. Adams. Um, and uh, Dr. Glass has been a, um, a partner of National History Academy from the, the very beginning. He's a director emeritus of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Uh, where he oversaw a transformation of that museum uh, in the early 2000s. Um, he's the, the author of 50 Great American Places, which is an outstanding book on place-based learning, which National History Academy is, is focused on. Uh, we're now in the third week of our summer programs with the Academy. We have uh, uh, over 300 students who've been involved with the, the program this summer from all around the country and all around the world. And we're thrilled to have uh, Melanie Adams and, and Brent Glass with us tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Brent. Thank you, Bill. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Melanie Adams. Uh, she is the director of the Smithsonian's Anacostia uh, Community Museum in Washington, DC. Uh, she has more than 25 years of experience of community engagement with museums and higher education. And she brings, uh, she's dedicated to bringing stakeholders together to address relevant community issues. She's in a perfect place now in her career to do this. From 2016 to 2019, she served as the Deputy Director for Learning Initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, for 11 years, from 2005 to 2016, she was the uh, Managing Director of the Missouri Historical Society. She oversaw more than 700 St. Louis community programs annually, including events with more than 100 community partners. Throughout her career, she has been a leader in the national conversation about museums, education, education race, and racial inequality. Uh, Dr. Adams holds a bachelor's degree in English and African American studies from the University of Virginia, a master's degree in education from the University of Vermont, and a doctorate from the University of Missouri St. Louis in educational leadership and policy studies. She's going to provide a background about the Anacostia Community Museum and then I will ask her a few questions um, about the museum and, and other related issues and at the end there will be opportunities for uh, our audience to ask her questions. So uh, with that it's my pleasure to introduce Melanie Adams. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you this evening um, and to talk all things history and museums. Um, so I would like to encourage, um, as was mentioned, please put um, your name and kind of where you're uh, coming in from um, in the chat. That's always just great to see. Well, I am going to share a presentation. It won't be a ton of slides, but I know some of you may never have been to the Anacostia Community Museum. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the museum. Um, this is a great um, current image um, of our museum. And over on the side, you see an exhibit that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, but the museum was actually founded in 1967 out of a time that's very similar to what's happening now. So if you think about your history, and what was happening in urban communities in 1967 around the civil rights movement. And so at that time, um, the secretary at the time of the Smithsonian, um, Secretary Ripley, really thought that it was important to provide a museum in the African American community. Um, and that is how the Anacostia Community Museum was born. Um, a location was selected um, east of the river. Um, so in, um, DC east of the river at the time was a predominantly African-American neighborhood. Um, and this is an image of our first director, John Kennard, standing in front of that first museum, um, which was located um, on the main thoroughfare um, in uh, the Anacostia community. And one of the things that was really um, unique about this that I always like to distinguish, um, we've always been a Smithsonian, so sometimes people don't know that, but we really are a museum that is focused on the stories of the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. 
This distinguishes us from our colleagues um, on the mall who really focus on national stories. Um, so I always say, if you wanna learn about Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King or larger historical figures, you'll find those stories on the, on the mall versus what you'll find at the Anacostia Community Museum is more of those local stories of men and women making change. So just a few ACM by the numbers. Um, we have a small budget compared to our colleagues. We have about $3 million per year. Our attendance, we have about 38,000 a year, um, which again, I always joke, that's like a weekend at air and space. Um, and our staff, we have about anywhere from 13 to 15 um, full-time employees at any time, and then a slew of contractors. So I wanted to share our uh, mission and vision because this is really important. And I know as history students and history buffs, you've probably been to quite a few museums. And traditionally, museums' mission and vision are really focused on collections, objects, items. So most missions, you're going to see words like collect, preserve, share. And one of the things that really drew me to this position was the mission statement, which centers community. So together with local communities, the Anacostia Community Museum illuminates and amplifies our collective power. So that mission really spoke to me because it centered the work and the people of the community. And then more importantly, our vision. Um, so for organizations, your mission is what you do on a daily basis, and your vision is really what you strive to do. And so one of the things that's really important to me in the work that we're doing at our museum is really focusing on that vision. And I think, you know, these last two years um, have been shown more important than ever why it's important to focus on this. And so our vision is hoping that urban communities activate their collective power for a more equitable future. So the exhibit I'm gonna briefly talk about to give you an idea of the type of work we do at the museum. Um, this is a new exhibit that just opened for us in April. Um, so we are, again, um, one of the few museums, we actually opened two outdoor exhibits um, during the pandemic. Um, this exhibit is located on our front plaza and it's an exhibit that we were already planning on doing. So exhibits take anywhere from three to five years to put together, to research and then develop. Um, so this exhibit around food equity issues was already in process um, when I arrived at the museum um, in 2019. But what we decided to do was we actually split it up into two. So this outside component of the exhibit is really focusing on issues of food inequality in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, and so what it does is it really shows you um, the inequality that happens in our food spaces, in communities, um, usually based on issues of race and um, economics. So this is a great example. And I'm sure depending upon where you're living, it's something very similar in your community. So um, on the left, you see DC Ward 3. And Ward 3 um, is, is where Georgetown is located. So it's a fairly affluent area in DC. And they have one full service grocery store for every 9,000 residents. Then when you go to Ward 8, which is um, where the museum is located, we have one grocery store for every 85,000 residents. Um, so these are the types of facts and figures um, we talk about in this outside exhibit. We also focus on the people and organizations in the DMV who are working to make positive change um, in the food space related to food equity. So you'll kind of see their stories um, scattered throughout um, the exhibit as well. And the final, final thing I will mention, um, one of the things that I'm really adamant about is in addition to telling these stories is we also provide action. So we provide opportunities for people to act. And part of doing that is making sure the museum is doing the same thing. So we partnered with an organization called Feed the Fridge, which is here in um, DC. And they actually provide, um, they provide us with this refrigerator and it's stocked with 100 free meals a day, Monday through Friday. And so anyone in the community can walk up and take a meal. Um, and this has really been a lifeline for a lot of the residents living around the museum because as we remain closed, this was really a way for us to 
provide something that was sorely needed in the community. Um, and so we're committed to this program and plan to have it um, in our parking lot for about two years. So that is um, ACM kind of in a nutshell. Um, so hopefully for those of you in the DMV area that encourages or excited you to possibly come and visit us um, when we open on August 6th. Now, and Brent, I think you're muted. Okay, thank you for unmuting me. And Melanie, thank you for that uh, background. It's so inspiring what you're doing and uh, fulfilling this mission uh, that is really unique for the Smithsonian. Um, and I, I want to ask a few questions, and we will have some questions from our, our audience, but this last year has been so uh, tumultuous, dramatic. I'm running out of words as far as what it, uh, the impact on our, our country has been, but how has it affected uh, the Anacostia Community Museum in terms of how you see yourself? And you're getting ready to reopen now. Um, the, you have the outdoor exhibits, but you're going to reopen the the indoor uh, exhibits, but how did the pandemic and then the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, how do you see that affecting your museum? Great, well, we're very place-based, meaning that, you know, obviously we want people to come to our museum because that's what museums do. So the pandemic really upended that. And a lot of my colleagues, um, both within the Smithsonian and around the country, all went virtual. So everyone started doing everything online and we followed suit and we did do some of that. But about, you know, six months in, I was really concerned because, again, a lot of our community members may not have had access to a lot of the digital resources they would need to be able to participate. And so that's why it was really important for me to begin figuring out how do we get out in the community safely. Um, so we did start doing, as you mentioned, our outdoor exhibits. We did an outdoor projection project, but just really looking at how could we be out in the community and not have people tied um, to a device? And I think with George Floyd, that, you know, one of the things that was really important there is that's the type of work we've always done. So again, that's the reason why I really love ACM is we're not pivoting, we're not changing. That is within our DNA is to address the issues um, related to um, communities. And so, I would say we didn't do anything different. We continue to do the work that we have always done. Um, but one of the things I will briefly mention that was um, a little more creative, I think, was as you've mentioned, we did have an outdoor exhibit um, called Men of Change, which looks at stories of African American men. But the great thing was my um, education director actually worked with the DC public um, jails. And so we were able to put that content on tablets that then went to the men and women who were in the DC jails. So again, it also really encouraged us to expand our definition of community. So just because you can't physically come to our museum doesn't mean you are not a member of our community. That's, that's um, it's inspiring. And it also, I think, reinforces the, uh, the notion that museum, I think people think of museums as, as passive um, experiences. And yet, you, as you say, you've been doing this and the, the museum has been doing this kind of active engagement for quite a while. And, and I think it'll be maybe sort of take several generations before people realize that museums are, are um, activists and, um, and not only um, putting uh, 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 artifacts on display. What will people see when they come inside the museum? When you, so the when inside, you we're going to focus on food history, culture, and organizing. So you'll see a lot of stories related to um, food organizing within the exhibit, but also the food process. So we wanted to uncover, mm -hmm. you know, people only think about what's at their table or what's at their local grocery store. And so they're looking at kind of the larger process and the way my um, curator decided to do it is he's gonna follow a chicken wing. Since chicken wings, you know, at happy hour, that's what everyone does. So he has a chicken wing from the minute it leaves the chicken all the way through the process. 
the, have, have you, um, did this, was this an occasion for you to add to your collection in any way? Did you have any uh, new, new artifacts and new collections coming in? We actually did. Um, so we did participate with um, American history and African American history and culture on a little collecting that happened at Black Lives Matter Plaza. Um, but again, we really wanted to make sure we had a local focus. So we also made sure we went to um, the protests that were happening in smaller communities around DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So we didn't necessarily only focus on that. And the other thing we did was we've started a collecting initiative with the Asian Pacific community around food ways. So mm -hmm. that ties in with our um, Food for the People exhibit. So we started collecting both stories and artifacts from that community. That, that, um, that is interesting because the Anacostia community itself has changed. The, 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 the uh, population uh, demography has changed. And so you, do you find the museum is trying to change along with that? Right. And I think, you know, that's really what's happening in all of DC, really that changing demographic. And so I think one of the things um, mm -hmm. that's exciting for the museum is figuring out who is our community and how we can best serve them. Um, so we do have new people moving into the community, people moving out, um, diverse cultures, and really figuring out kind of what, what, it, what brings people together, what is the common denominator, and how can we help with that? Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, will you have, in addition to exhibits, uh, program, uh, ongoing programs related to this, uh, this theme? Yes, yes. So um, what I decided to do, we actually, it's a whole year long theme. So each year we have a different theme and this year it's related to food. And so on our program side, we're actually doing um, a Black Panthers breakfast box. Um, so we're working with um, some of the DC public schools located near the museum to create a box that'll recreate um, as best as we can, <laughs> some of the food that would be in there, but more importantly, the information about the Black Panthers, um, because that's something, again, that's in the exhibit. Um, and then we're also doing more traditional online lectures. And we also have a garden series, because as you know, during COVID, everyone started growing gardens and really looking at gardens, but also looking at the history of gardens in African-American communities. So for a lot of African-Americans, you know, it's been substance, a substance. It hasn't been this hobby. Um, so really talking about that history as well. Do you have a, a garden, outdoor garden a space? Do. Do you have we have five um, outdoor garden beds that we put in um, last September. So we're able to kind of do programs on site and do harvest and everything. That's great. So what do you say is the biggest challenge? And I know having worked in the Smithsonian <laughs> that the and worked at one of the big mall um, museums that we tend to um, dominate the public attention. But as, as a museum that's community-based, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges you have? I think some of, I think my biggest challenge, and again, this ties with the Smithsonian, is really trying to determine how do we measure our impact. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, my colleagues on the other side of the, or on the mall, they're always going to have the numbers. So you, they don't have to think about it. They can show impact because they had 4 million people walk through their doors. I can't show impact in the same way. So one of the things I really want to figure out is how do we show our impact? Um, how do we show that us putting an exhibit in a community positively impacted that community? So I think that's one of the biggest struggles. Yeah. Let me ask you to put your, your educator's hat on for a moment. And, but, but it's related to being a museum director. There's so much talk now on the teaching of American history and especially the teaching of slavery, Jim Crow, civil rights, um, the, the ongoing narrative of, of race and race relations and racial uh, inequality. How do you, as an educator, uh, how do you reflect on that? Right. I think it's really important for us to think about it in terms of American history. And American history is not complete if we are not telling all of these stories. And I think it's important to also be able to put them in context um, because you're missing a lot. You're missing large parts of the story if they're not told it, that if they're told in a way that excludes certain people. 
And I feel like when I was growing up and learning this, we did not learn any of that. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey and I would say, you know, our education was woefully, <laughs> I mean, we missed a lot. And now I think students are savvy. Students are gonna ask questions. They know when you're leaving things out and they'll, they're able to connect the dots. And so I think history, if we expect to have informed citizens, we have to be able to tell them the story in a complete way. And I think the way we've taught history in the past has not been complete. You know, before we take any more questions, I, it, I, any questions from the audience, it does uh, occur to me, you said growing up in New Jersey, what was the uh, pivotal moment for you that led you into becoming a educator and a historian? What, what, what inspired you to do that? That's a good question. I think my love of history did start in undergrad because I remember taking my first African American history course at Virginia. Before then, we essentially had nothing. Wow. Um, so really, that really opened my eyes to everything I didn't know. And even though I was in higher education student affairs, I still focused on that history. Like I remember one of the first programs I did, uh, my first job out was um, UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first program I did was with Melba Patilla Beals, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. Yes. And she lived over in Marin. And I was all excited. I was like, do you know who this woman is? Do you know what she did? And the students were like, yeah, whatever. Like they were not as excited as I was. <laughs> so I've always had that idea of kind of history. You have to know your history in order to know where you're going and where you came from. And so I've always had that love, even if I was in another field. Well, you'll be, you'll be happy to know that when we had the residential program for the uh, National History Academy, Ernest Green was oh, one yeah. of our speakers on two occasions, oh, and the students did know who he was. And uh, it, was one, it was probably the, the high point of the, of the program of that both summers uh, oh, for the National History Academy because here was someone who as a high school student right. uh, was a history maker mm -hmm. uh, and the students uh, definitely related to that to that story so and I think just one more quick thing to add I think why yeah. things like that are really important is I feel like students look at people like that today and they think of them as old and I always yeah. want to say they weren't old when they did when they changed history so when you yes. look at John Lewis he was 19 and 20. He was yeah. not, you know, 85. <laughs> so I think some of that is lost if they don't know the history. Yeah, and it also, to me, reminds us that many of these, m many of the, the pivotal changes that occurred were led by students. The students right. were very much involved. I know at, at the American History Museum, we had on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Greensboro sit-in, mm -hmm. Uh, we had three of the four surviving Greensboro Four. Uh, they were freshmen in, in college when they did when they when they staged that sit-in. So these were young people. Uh, John Lewis, in fact, John Lewis was our speaker uh, at that occasion. And um, you know, Ernest Green, John Lewis, all these these uh, individuals, um, um, I think, uh, made history when they were very young. Yeah. And it's uh, never too early to, uh, to become engaged and become involved. And I think this ties back to your first or second question about Black Lives Matter. And I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of these protests or you're seeing young people take the lead, um, which is wonderful and kind of learning about protest movements and how to be effective and advocating and using your voice. But do we, let me ask you this, do you find that uh, when you meet some of the student leaders, uh, meet some of the people who are involved now in Black Lives Matter, do they have a sense of history about the civil rights, their predecessors in the civil rights movement, or do we have to keep telling those stories? I think we have to keep telling them, but I think a lot of them understand that they're standing on the shoulders of others. I think mm -hmm. early on, um, and this was like 2010, 2011, when you had more, the earlier protests, they didn't quite understand as much, but no, they, they understand their history almost better than we do mm -hmm. um, and understand that they're building upon a legacy. Well, you have at, at Anacostia, I remember you have some very interesting civil rights uh, history in your collection uh, from, the, from the local uh, communities. So I think that's, uh, that's a, always been a big part of your collecting uh, uh, priorities. Correct, correct, and correct. And I think again with that D 
DC, Maryland, Virginia focus, um, even looking at, um, I know with um, Freddie Gray that happened in Maryland, we have images um, from protests there, which is why it was really important for us to continue doing that when, um, when um, Black Lives Matter Plaza and everything came up, was really looking at how is the community using their voice, uh, raising their voice in protest over what's happening. Uh, well, we have an, a number of questions that are coming in, and uh, let me uh, begin with that. I may have some more of my own, but uh, I don't want to monopolize uh, this conversation. Uh, one uh, question said, do you think you will continue to create outdoor exhibitions after the pandemic restrictions are fully lifted and the museum uh, reopens? Yes, so um, outdoor exhibits have now been kind of, or will become part of our DNA because it allows us to get out in the community. So we'll either do them on our plaza or um, as we did with Men of Change, we were in the Deanwood community, which is about three or four miles from the museum. So yes, we will continue to do that. And, and just as museums have developed more of an online presence, um, I think they've also begun to, to develop more of an outdoor uh, right. presence. I know I was uh, involved with the National Building Museum mm -hmm. uh, for a, uh, about a year. And one of our first exhibits, even though the museum was not open, was a Murals That Matter uh, outdoor exhibit where we were able to uh, display some of the murals that were painted on, on plywood uh, that had been covering windows during the Black Lives Matter protests. And we brought those murals um, over to the uh, building museum. It was a very effective uh, uh, outdoor exhibition. Um, let's see, uh, other questions. Should museums be neutral or take on advocacy roles to affect change? Um, I think that depends upon your museum. Um, as a Smithsonian, we cannot advocate, but I think what that question is really asking is museums have never really been neutral by virtue of the decision of what you're going to collect mm -hmm. <laughs> and what you're going to show. Yes. Um, so I feel it's our, um, it's our role to really make sure we're educating people so they can make informed decisions. Um, and the way I think about it is, as I mentioned in all of our exhibits moving forward, we do provide people with an opportunity to act. And so we're calling them take action. So after they learn about the topic, what you hear is people say, that's great, but what can I do? Mm -hmm. Like you've told me mm -hmm. how horrible or what's happening with gentrification in my community, what can I do about it? Um, so I think that's our role is to be able to share the information and these are some ways you can motivate or you can promote change in your community. Do you think, uh, Melanie, that museums remain, I know I remember reading, um, um, surveys that museums are trusted institutions. Right. Um, do you still find that to be the case um, from your audience and from what you see around the country and, and, think, and, 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 and the costume? Right, I find that I think we still are because unfortunately, it's, again, with our audience, our audience is still skewing older. <laughs> um, I think if it's skewed a little younger, maybe we'd have a little more cynicism, but I think you know people still believe if it is in a museum, it is true. Um, and so that puts even more pressure on us to make sure we not only get the story right, but we make sure all voices are in the story. Yes, I, I, um, I, I want to go back to your um, initiative with the DC jail, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, I have a, an interest in criminal justice history, and you, you and I have th discussed this, and criminal justice reform. Um, I've been involved in a, um, helping create a museum in New York at Sing Sing Prison. And um, tell me a little bit more about what, what inspired that initiative and what, the, what has been some of the outcomes. Sure, so we've always worked with um, the DC Public Library. So libraries and museums always usually have a great relationship. And so working with the libraries, they're the ones, they run a library in the jail. And so when they were talking with my education director, they mentioned that due to COVID, um, they were having to keep people um, in their cell 23 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was provide each inmate with a um, tablet, but the tablets are not connected to the internet. So you can't just download material. They have to be loaded with material. And so the Men of Change exhibit was just 
perfect content um, mm -hmm. talking about um, the resiliency of African American men in their stories. Um, it was just perfect content to put on this tablet. And so we were able to, we created a, a, a um, video walking tour. So they are looking at a video as um, actually a student from Ron Brown High School is our moderator, um, who's walking them around the exhibit and really talking about the importance of the exhibit and the different things that are in it. Um, so that's another program that we're going to look at how can we um, continue that relationship because again, when you look at the DC area, a lot of the uh, men and women in that jail are in wards from Ward 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. So they're still our community members. And so how do we provide content for them as well? We have another question, I think, that's come in. Oh, yeah. Uh, Warriors <laughs> cry. Yep. <laughs> What do you do in your day to your job? What is what is it like to be a museum director? I remember I, before you answer, while you're thinking about it, when I was directing American History Museum and we closed for renovation for two years, and I remember people saying to me, "Well, now what are you going to do? You you have you don't have anything to do because you're closed." But I think that's not really the case. But can you describe your your day to day? Job. Sure, sure. And that, you know, sounds like my mother. She was the same way. She's like, what do you do now? And I was like, I still have a lot to do. Um, a museum director's job is a lot of meetings. It is a lot of meetings. Um, and yes. so that is still happening. And we're all, we're still planning. Um, so even though our building was closed, we were still planning our exhibits, our programs. So there was really little difference in terms of the workload. And I would almost have to say, it was more while we were closed. Um, and so I think people are looking forward to getting back into a rhythm of being open and also welcoming visitors. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a lot of meetings. Um, one of the things when we're open, I always like to do is it's always great to just go down in the gallery and eavesdrop on people mm -hmm. to kind of hear how they're yes. enjoying the experience, kind of listening to what's resonating with them. Um, so that's one of the things I think I miss the most from being closed. That, that's a great point because I often found that the informal learning that goes on at a museum is is really important between the generations. You know, I would see uh, uh, children with their grandparents and that sharing of information that you, that really only happens in a museum or historic site because when you go to the theater, you, you, you can't talk to your neighbor during the performance. But when you're at a museum, you're encouraged to to share that information. I think that's really important. Right, and I think, you know, to your point, that intergenerational um, connection, when I was in Missouri, um, we had a program, Teens Make History, which are teens who um, research, write, and perform plays, historically-based plays. And the first play they did was about the sit-ins in St. Louis, the lunch counter sit-ins. And one of the young women, like her grandmother, started telling her how she was involved. And the girl was like, I never knew any of this. Why mm -hmm. didn't I know any of this? Mm -hmm. And it's exactly yeah. like you said, when they're kind of, um, they see something and they start telling a story and talking, it really brings out stories in a way that normally they wouldn't. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, when you are planning your exhibits and, um, and programs, how involved does the community get and what role do they play in shaping your decisions or the, the, uh, the, the whole plan for the, for the uh, ex exhibitions or programs? Yeah, so the way um, we work at the museum, and we're actually going to be going through a new um, exhibit planning process, but we use the voices of the community to tell the story. And by that, I mean, for example, the one we have coming up um, on um, food history, culture, and justice, it's a lot, it's based on oral history. So my curator, um, you know, for the last exhibit, he did over 200. This one, he did only about 100 because of COVID. Um, but it's really based on the stories and what he's learning um, during these oral histories, in addition to some obvious traditional research. So really the community helps us shape the stories we're going to tell because they're their stories. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then in terms of programs, we really try to do a lot of partnerships with the community. So there are a variety of different ways. It could be um, a co-created program mm -hmm. or it could just be community members on a panel. So it just really all depends. Do you, do you anticipate continuing to use that process uh, for other exhibits? I mean, food is such a, a natural to engage, involve people. 
And I think it's, it's a great gateway into, um, into community history. Do you, do you envision other, other topics coming up that will involve the community in the same yeah. way? Yeah, I definitely think so. So as I mentioned, um, for the next five years, we have all of our topics laid out. So we have yeah. food this year. Next year, um, for 2022, we have housing, um, followed by um, the environment, education, and then ending with health. And all of that is leading up to 2026 and our country's 250th anniversary. So essentially, we are examining all of these kind of issues around related to equity in those different areas. And then for 2026, what type of future do we want to see? Mm -hmm. Well, that, you know, that leads into another question that came in as far as when you talk about equity, the whole uh, um, emphasis now on diversity and equity, inclusion, access, justice. Um, how do you see museums performing in, in this area? I know we're, I'm old enough to remember the uh, equity and ex excellence uh, report in the early 1990s that the uh, it was then called the American Association of Museums uh, uh, issued, uh, but it's it's been slow, don't you think, in terms of diverse, the diverse, uh, diversifying uh, the museum staffing and boards? Uh, well, um, can think, you comment on that? Right, I think it really has, and I think in terms of the museum staff, one of the issues, biggest issues we face is what qualifications do you actually need to work in a museum? And I think sometimes we're, we may be asking for qualifications that are not necessary. And I say, for example, my director of education is gonna be looking for some educators. And she's like, I just need someone who's 18 and wants to learn. Like, mm -hmm. we don't expect you to have the history. We want people who want to engage with audiences, have a way of connecting. So I think we need to rethink about really what do we need for these positions and these uh, position descriptions. Um, I also think we need to look at for the board level, that's always a little harder because the board is usually the one who's financing or helping to bring funds into your museum. Yes. Um, and so that funding model really sets itself up in a way that you need people with access to money. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and that's not to say there aren't people of color who don't have that access, but they're probably taken. <laughs> you know, it's like they're stretched thin because everyone's calling them. There's a lot of competition for, for people, uh, uh, no matter what their background is, who can provide access to, uh, to funding. You do, you do have an advisory board though, right? Yes, we do have an advisory board, which that makes us a little different from a traditional museum. Because um, in a traditional museum, the board hires and fires the director and fiscally responsible for the organization, whereas the advisory board serves more in advisory capacity, um, helping with fundraising really. Um, so yes, yeah, so they have been great. And one of the nice things though about Anacostia it's not that I don't have to worry about diversity and inclusion, but mine is baked in. So, you know, my staff is diverse by nature, the fact of who we are and what we, um, what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the same as some of your more traditional museums. Yes. So thinking about the, some of the more traditional museums, how would you, and this is a, a um, this just occurred to me as we're talking, uh, you have worked in uh, more um, traditional museums in Missouri and Minnesota. Um, how would you compare those organizations and what they're going through? And you still, I know, may maintain a connection there. And actually, you were uh, leading a lot of the change in both, right. those, uh, both those institutions. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that went? Sure. So I think, you know, it's hard because they are primarily white organizations at yeah. their core. And the difference, especially with Minnesota, was just the legislative connection there. Um, you don't you didn't have that as much in Missouri in terms of this holding tight to traditional history mm -hmm. um, and what that meant. Um, but I think diversifying the staff was always hard because um, no one wants to be the only one in the department, but you can't diversify if people don't come over and really um, get hired. And I know I still have friends at both who are like, send me candidates. And I'm like, that's great. I can send you candidates, but you also have to look at your culture. 
So you could hire someone and you don't yes. retain them. Yes. And a lot of organizations are not willing to take that inside look. Like, why aren't we retaining people? It must be them, not us. That's a really great point because I do so much work now with uh, large and small organizations. And I wish I, Melanie, I wish I had taken more uh, courses in anthropology when I was uh, uh, an undergraduate because so much comes back to the, the culture of the organization. Uh, the governance is one thing, but the, and the staffing, but um, unless you have that cultural um, predisposition to wanting to really change, it's hard. And and you you know, I worked at Smithsonian. You're at Smithsonian. I think there's a real commitment there to um, be inclusive, uh, but it in it, it really varies from from place to place, okay. uh, even within a big institution like the Smithsonian. Right. And I think we saw a lot of this again right after um, George Floyd was murdered and museums putting out statements. Yeah. And so everyone's like, statements are great, but not many people acted beyond the statement. And I feel like everyone got, um, was a, everyone, um, especially around, for example, Juneteenth. So last year, everyone got Juneteenth off. And this year, they just lucked out that it became a national holiday because I was thinking, would you have given people off again this year or was it just a flash in the pants because of 2019 mm -hmm. and, you know so i think there's still a lot of work to be done around issues of diversity and equity and changing of culture but you know as someone pointed out to me uh in another institution when corporations um adopt a diversity or inclusion uh, initiative they're still producing the same product you know if they make cars they still are making cars. But museums and nonprofits and cultural organizations really are trying to change um, their product in many ways. It's not just going to be the same old exhibits uh, if you really embrace the, uh, the diversity challenge and the diversity, the, the, um, the, the diversity um, component of your, of your organization. So that's, that's a real difference, don't you think? I think it is, but I also think when you're looking at corporations, you know, when there's always some snafu that they did around issue of diversity, you're always like, no person of color was in the room when that decision was made, or that wouldn't have happened. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. where, yeah. whereas they might not be changing their product, maybe how they're promoting their product or who they're targeting their product um, towards, I think would be, would shift a little because yeah. like every other, um, whether it's a product or whether it's a museum, our audiences have to shift. Yeah. As the country changes, so must our product and our audience. Yeah, I think that's gonna be the exciting thing in museums is, is um, I've often, uh, people will say, well, uh, you're all about your collection. And some museums have fabulous collections and they're very co collections driven. But more and more, I think museums are gonna be audience driven. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, not only building audience, but retaining it. And that's going to flow into more financial support uh, right. for those museums to show their, their connection to their community. Right. Well, and as you know, having run American history, we don't have any more space. <laughs> There's no more space to collect. So I think it is really important to look at kind of what we're collecting and what story, what story they will tell because yeah. space is precious. Yes. Well, let me see. I think there's, um, I don't know if there's another um, comment. Let's see, outside exhibits. Yeah, I think the last one was your day-to-day -day job. I don't know if there were any that came on over Facebook Live at all. I'll ask. Um, I don't, oh, okay. We have one here. What is the one thing you hope people take away most from visiting the museum? That's a great question. Yeah, that is. I think the thing I hope they take away the most is they have the power to make change. Um, that is an individual, I mean, that's really what we focus on at our museum. You know, one of our taglines used to be, you know, um, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So we're telling the stories of everyday people who are committed to making change in their neighborhood. So I want someone to come to our museum and have a spark of an idea to be able to say, oh, I can do this. I can do something similar. This person lived in my neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. So to really see themselves mm -hmm. in the stories we're telling. 
just another one coming in. Do you have any advice for um, someone coming into uh, a community museum uh, to, to uh, for their own uh, to carry out to their own museum, right? To their own community, I should say. Well, I think there. Are, I think pretty much most most communities have a community museum. It's probably a small historical society. Um, or a small community museum. So I think what's important is figuring out how can you partner with, our, with, with what's already there? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a common problem with nonprofits. We have way too many and so the resources are really stretched thin. But I think you know, going to your current local community mu uh, local museum and seeing what they're doing. And again, the other one I mentioned were libraries. Yes. Here in DC, the libraries, we've put exhibits there. So you also have to maybe expand what your thinking is around a museum because it doesn't have to be what you traditionally think of as a four walled museum. Mm -hmm. It could be something outdoors at the metro station. So kind of figuring out what is your purpose? Is it to bring community together? Is it to share their stories? I think that'll help you determine what type of space you're looking for. Yeah, I think that's, that's um, you know, bringing the museum to the community as well as the community coming to the museum is a great, uh, great analogy. Well, you know, Melanie, I think we can go on and on with the conversation, but I, I, I'm so impressed with what you're doing. And I just can't think of a better fit at this particular time for the Anacostia Community Museum. And I've known several of the directors there, but uh, you're just in such a great place there. and. Uh, congratulations. Uh, you came in at a very challenging moment. You you came in at, at the end of 2019? or Yeah, I came in in August of 2019 and then we shut down in March. And yeah. so I've been out of the office longer than I've been in the office. Yeah. Well, it would be great to see you get back in the office uh, with the museum opening on August 6th. And uh, for all our uh, people who are watching on Facebook and in this uh, Zoom uh, video conference, uh, please put that on your calendar and thank you so much for uh, joining us and joining the National History Academy. And when we are uh, back in person, hopefully in the uh, not too distant future, we'd love for you to come and visit uh, in oh, person. That would be uh, wonderful. I'd be excited to. Thanks. Right. So thank much. you, everyone. Bye bye.